Good afternoon. My name is Stapleton Roy. I'm the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. For those of you who are new to the Wilson Center, uh, we're a unique institution in that we were created by Congress in 1968 uh, as a living memorial to the only American president who actually had a doctorate. Uh, we, our goal is to try to bring together the world of scholarship and public policy. And uh, we have programs that cover every part of the world. Uh, our program today is focused on the question of the United States and China and global governance. A lot of attention is being given to the U.S.-China bilateral relationship, and there's some attention to the question of China's role in global governance, expressed perhaps best by Bob Zellick when he talked about China being a responsible stakeholder in the international system. Of course, there's a problem, which is that China doesn't want to be a responsible stakeholder in ways that are defined by the United States. Uh, it wants to be a member of the uh, global government system and be part of making the rules and deciding what responsible be behavior is in its own right and not dependent on other countries telling it how it should behave responsibly. But these are some of the issues that arise when you have an established international system and suddenly you have a major new player emerge uh, who properly should have a much larger role in global governance than it has had in the past. Uh, and some of these issues will be touched on in our presentations today. Uh, we have, um, we'll have two presenters, uh, Scott Kennedy, a professor at the uh, University of Indiana, and uh, Dr. Uh, Hefang, uh, Hefan, uh, from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and we're fortunate to have with us also Professor uh, Miles Collar from the University of California, San Diego, who's here at the Wilson Center uh, this year, and he will offer some comments on the presentations um, by uh, Professor Kennedy and Dr. Uh, he. Uh, so with that said, Scott, can I turn it over to you? Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you all for, for, for coming today. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ambassador Roy, uh, the Kissinger Institute, and the Wilson Center for hosting today's events. Um, this is the culmination of several years of, of research and collaboration between scholars in the United States, Europe, Australia, uh, China, and Japan, uh, f from our center's perspective. Um, this work that we've, we've done over the past few years has been supported by the Henry Luce Foundation, uh, to which we're immensely grateful. Um, we also have a, a wonderful staff uh, in my research center, the Research Center for Chinese Politics and Business. Uh, our communications director, uh, Andrea, is here today, and she's done a lot of the work uh, in preparing the document that is in front of you. Um, and, and so we, we're very grateful for her, as well as the work of the, of the staff from the Institute of World Economics and Politics, uh, where Hufan uh, is deputy director. Um, I thought what I would do is uh, say a little bit about our center uh, and where this fits into our work. Uh, Hufan will say a little bit about where it fits into the work of, of his institute. And then we're going to get right to the results uh, and tell you our, our bottom line. Uh, we think that'll be about uh, th uh, 30 minutes altogether or so. And then we're really grateful uh, that Professor Kaler is here, uh, given his expertise on, on global, uh, global political economy and finance issues, uh, we think would tremendously add to the discussion, and, and uh, so we look forward to that as well. Uh, again, our center, uh, based at Indiana University, uh, but we're, uh, we have an office in Beijing. So um, I'm the Zhu uh, Jingban Zhu Ren in Beijing as well. And uh, we have um, staff in both places. And we feel, uh, although Sarah Palin can see Russia from Wasilla, we can't see Beijing from Bloomington. Uh, <laughs> and even when you're in Beijing, you can't see Beijing either. <laughs> so, um, but our, our center's uh, purpose is to do uh, uh, policy-oriented research that speaks both to audiences in academia as well as uh, outside in the business and policy communities, and then to bring those people all together before we do the research, while we're doing the research, and then after we've, we've done the research. 
Um, and certainly if we were not in Beijing, uh, where uh, our office is on the campus of UIBE, we would have never had the opportunity to collaborate with Cass and, and with such a fine scholar as Hufan. So it's really been a tremendous opportunity uh, for us. Uh, I may, I, I occasionally pass through Beijing before I started living there. I think it's unlikely that Hufan would have been walking through Bloomington on his way to anywhere. Uh, and so being in Beijing together has been a, a tremendous uh, of benefit for us. Um, our center, this initiative on China and global governance uh, that we've been working on for the last three years has involved 30 research projects from, by 40 scholars uh, from several continents. Uh, we've had four uh, very large conferences, two in Beijing, one in Indiana, and another in Geneva uh, in last September. Um, we've had a series of seven roundtables between uh, Chinese business leaders and um, uh, the top economic policy leadership of the embassy in Beijing. Uh, and we've done those all in Chinese. Uh, so we've had a very good turnout and engagement on both sides on those questions that have been about uh, global governance. Uh, and then we created a uh, informal uh, uh, global governance experts group. And uh, we started having meetings. Uh, Hufan and I started hosting these meetings in November uh, in Beijing, here in Washington, in New York, uh, with people who's, who touch upon global governance in their work in one way or the other from government business uh, from the private sector, from NGOs, uh, to get their suggestions of, of what we ought to do. Um, and, and we um, benefited greatly from that advice. Uh, we had one session here in Washington, was at the, the Peterson Institute. Um, and, and so that's what brought us to creating uh, this uh, report. Uh, I thought what I ought to do right now is, is, is give uh, Hufan a, a moment to be able to introduce a little bit more about how his institute comes into this project. Okay, thank you, Scott. Uh, first, I would like to uh, join uh, Scott for um, uh, to thank uh, Ambassador Roy and also uh, Wilson Center and also the uh, distinguished uh, participants coming for the workshop today. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited uh, here. And I'm with the Institute of World Economics and the Politics from Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And CAS is one of the major think tanks in China, which is affiliated to the State Council, but we do our independent research. Um, in my institute, we mainly cover uh, international economics and also international politics, and especially on the issue of global governance, and we follow up the issue of G20 and BRICS and the regional economic cooperation and recently we uh, uh, established a new uh, research center on global governance. And this topic of um, uh, how China and other countries uh, can um, play a more positive role in global governance was first uh, uh, raised up by the former Deputy Premier Wang Qishan. And he asked the question how China can play a more uh, active role in global governance. I think uh, um, early uh, last year, but then uh, he uh, changed his job, his more important job is now on the uh, uh, anti-corruption. But we think that this uh, issue is still very important. So and, and then uh, comes uh, Scott Kennedy, so uh, we decided that maybe uh, we can uh, continue uh, the research on this topic. Um, so um, we, uh, uh, unlike university and college, we mainly do policy-oriented research. So we have a very close relationship with major government departments in China, uh, including the Ministry of Finance, uh, the Central Bank, uh, Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and sometimes we uh, work directly for the, uh, uh, the Center Party and the State Council. But neither of this job uh, as challenging as working with Scott Kennedy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope that's not too much of a criticism. <laughs> um, working with you has been easy compared to working with any Chinese institution that I've had the experience to work with, so, and many American ones. <laughs> so, um, okay, what I want to do now is, is, is uh, uh, Hufan and I want to tell you what our, our bottom line conclusions are. There's a lot of details in the report that we don't want to go into in our, but we just, in the initial presentation, so we just, uh, there, there are going to be um, gaps in what I say uh, and not a lot of details. Um, 
and uh, and so I hopefully a lot of that will come out in the discussion. But we want to take the discussion in the direction that you all want to go into, and and uh, based on the issues that that uh, Professor Kaler raises as as well. Uh, if you want more of the the details about the research over the last several years that's gone into it, I just direct you to our website uh, where you can find all those original 30 working papers uh, as well as uh, this little uh, book that we put together and issued last fall uh, from Rule Takers to Rule Makers, The Growing Role of Chinese in Global Governance, where we took 12 of those 30, squished them down from 10,000 words to 2,000 or 3,000 words, took out all the footnotes and all the academic jargon, and that's on our website as well. Okay, so we're going to give you a lot of uh, information and a lot of different uh, policy recommendations, but we really just want you to remember one thing if you're only going to remember one thing. We hope you remember a lot more, um, but if you're going to remember just one thing, please remember that from in our perspective, both China and the United States need to be more responsible stakeholders. And Bass, uh, Treasury Secretary Zelik, uh, when he made these remarks in September of 2005, his point was that he hoped China would not only live up to its commitments that it had made to the WTO and other international organizations, but that it would take on a more of a leadership role, a, pos a productive leadership role in these various organizations. Um, we th think that's true, but we think the same is exactly true for the United States, and that just as China, there are times when, Ch when the United States doesn't live up to its commitments and doesn't play the leadership role that it ought to play uh, in global governance. Uh, and so we think that both of these important countries uh, need to do so in order for us to address some of the problems uh, that the world faces, uh, because in many ways uh, the global governance institutions are not as effective as they should be, and as a result we're facing many more problems that are, that are harder and harder to deal with. Now the report that uh, we put together and the research um, that we're going to focus on today um, fo looks at three areas, uh, trade, uh, investment, uh, and finance. And in each of these three areas, uh, we uh, are looking at, at issues relevant for global governance at multiple levels. Uh, global governance does mean summits between uh, leaders who fly in on big planes with big delegations and negotiate, but it also means uh, the meetings between bureaucracies of different governments when they're talking about the, the uh, national regulations that are relevant. Uh, for those international agreements. It also means, global governance also means when you get a, when your company hires a lawyer and you accuse another company of dumping products in your country and then you'll uh, have that adjudicated by the national, by your government. Um, and so global governance occurs at many levels and we want and we think that in order to uh, address the problems that we're going to need policy recommendations that are not only at the multilateral level but at the regional bilateral and domestic level as well. All right. So first I'm going to say something about uh, sort of some of our general thoughts about in ways that the U.S. and China could help to improve global governance. Uh, then I'll say something about trade. Uh, and then Hufan is going to uh, uh, speak to uh, global governance related to investment issues uh, and to finance. So um, again, as I was uh, saying before, and one of the things that motivates us to write this report uh, and this research is uh, that global governance uh, faces severe gridlock, uh, just as bad as gridlock here in Washington. Right? Um, the Doha Round, uh, which is 11 years old now at least, uh, has died a long, slow death. Uh, and the uh, political will for the member countries of the WTO to reach a deal has declined gradually over th those past 11 years, uh, highlighted by a collapse of the negotiations very public in the summer of 2008. But even before then, uh, the political will to make a deal had slowly been eroded. Uh, and, and today, uh, one of the things that one can do if you travel to Geneva is have an opportunity to meet with uh, members of the diplomatic community there with no difficulty whatsoever. You want to talk to the senior staff of the WTO, to the ambassadors uh, and the uh, officials from the member countries who are there, no problem, because they have nothing to do. And they, they are totally willing to meet uh, boring professors from the American Midwest, <laughs> uh, even. So, uh, 
So uh, that's my measure of whether you're important. If you have time to see me, you're n nothing's going on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, the G20 uh, with the uh, Pittsburgh meeting uh, right after the crisis broke out uh, made some tremendous uh, agreements, things that were implemented, uh, but since Pittsburgh, not a whole heck of a lot uh, that's, that's, uh, that we're seeing in terms of progress. And as a result of this vacuum that's been created by lack of progress at the multilateral level, we're seeing a variety of countries across the globe in, engage in protectionism, whether it's the using of anti-dumping or other trade remedies, non-tariff barriers, uh, probably not to the extent that some people had expected, but still significant. Uh, we've also seen the expansion of, of, of regional FTAs. Uh, the United States now is, seems to be focused heavily on two, uh, the TPP and the Transatlantic Agreement, uh, and, and China as well. Uh, and other countries, uh, uh, and then at the same time, uh, monetary expansion by multiple countries. So if you can't uh, have progress at the global multilateral level, ways which would help growth, uh, these are the things that folks are doing now. And, uh, and we think some of these things are healthy, but some of them are also, we think, counterproductive. Uh, now, it would be wonderful if the United States and China could uh, collaborate uh, to address these problems, bring everyone back to the G, uh, WTO, uh, make the G G20 much more effective, um, and, and other institutions. But they have uh, conflicting approaches uh, with regard to global governance uh, that, that make that collaboration difficult. And so a lot of the suggestions that we're going to make, we don't, we're not, we don't know if anyone's going to adopt them because they're, they're not easy. Uh, the first is c uh, the contested identity of China. Um, Chinese uh, consider themselves part of a developing country, Fajan Zhong Guojia. Um, if you work for Cisco or General Motors or Boeing, you don't think of China as a developing country because you have to deal with Huawei, with Geely, uh, and with AVIC uh, or, and other very powerful, successful Chinese companies. That they come from a supposedly developing country is not what they see. Uh, China's trade balance doesn't look like a developing country trade balance. So we, uh, many Americans see China as a rising power, uh, and both uh, elites in government and the public. Um, and that disagreement or, or difference of identity uh, then has implications for what people expect China's role to be at the global level. Um, and now, on a working level, one of the things we found in our meetings with, with experts is that uh, over the past few months is that at the working level, those things may not matter a whole lot. But if you're a politician and you're trying to set broad parameters for policy, it matters. Secondly is the differences in, uh, in their approaches to global governance. The United States is a vibrant, uh, democratic country in which interest groups push and pull uh, in which uh, industry associations and NGOs are highly active domestically and internationally. Um, and as a result, the United States participates in a wide variety and takes leadership roles in a wide variety of global governance institutions that promote the interests not only of companies, but of environmental groups, of labor, of, of uh, investors uh, related to public health. And not only does the U.S. government do this, uh, American, the private sector does as well. NGOs, companies, very active across the board. And they aren't active just on the sidelines of official state-to-state -state meetings. They're active in groups that they create. And many of these groups set the rules of the game in those areas of global governance. Because global governance isn't just government-to-government -government diplomacy. It also, there's a lot of private global governance as well. In fact, uh, Professor Kaler uh, edited a terrific book just about this exact topic several years ago, which I love to cite because of how important it is and what it points out. Um, by contrast, uh, China uh, is a country uh, by, for, and of industry. It sees global governance institutions through the prism of how that will help China grow, and, how, and that's critical for Chinese industry. Largely state-owned, but not entirely state-owned. So China is much less active in institutions that promote the, the environment, public health, uh, investors, uh, others outside of industry. Where those institutions are primarily constraining on industry, Chinese less, are less active. 
In addition, uh, China has a very different political system than the United States, where industry associations are not well developed, where NGOs are not very or are not as active and autonomous as they are in the United States. And these differences mean that at global governance, China is much more comfortable in state-to-state -state bodies and in those that promote the interests of industry more naturally. And when it comes to non-state institutions, the Chinese feel less comfortable. And they often take efforts to bring the state in uh, to those institutions, what I call sovereignize those organizations and rules, to make states be able to have a voice. Because China is a government, has a very big voice. You just think of rare earths or iron ore, and you can think about the role that the state is, didn't have but now plays. In addition, although the United States and China have many complementary economic interests, and you can see the amount of trade that we have uh, and the amount of investment between both sides and the number of uh, people that travel back and forth, the number of flights, et cetera, um, how complementary our economies are overall. But there are uh, ways in which we compete with each other, and certainly China's effort to avoid a middle income trap, uh, become more innovative, means that the Chinese aren't going to, are increasingly uncomfortable with just simply being assemblers or manufacturers. They want to have control at the design level and at the product marketing level as well. Uh, and so that means uh, over time you're going to see increasing uh, competition in some areas, which is fine. The U.S. and European com countries do so as well. Uh, what we're, and global governance isn't about just making everyone agree with each other. It's about coming up with rules to manage in a systematic way competition as well. But these things make, the, make it difficult for the two sides to work comfortably sometimes in global governance. So here's some of our sort of broader recommendations. First, um, at the unilateral level, just leaving aside things where they're directly involved, both sides need to clean up their own house, not just their own air, but their own house as well. Uh, for, for China, uh, that means uh, avoiding a middle income trap uh, and uh, promoting a more efficient economy, a better educational system, greater health care, and a stronger social safety net for urbanites and rural uh, inhabitants as well. Um, for the United States, uh, I think everyone here, I don't even, uh, since I live in Indiana, even though I'm a Washington native, you all, you all know what's going on here better than I do, and you, you know what needs to be cleaned up, uh, so there's no reason for me to even summarize that. Um, and of course, if you're a, a, a holder of U.S. Treasury bonds, you know you're even more concerned uh, than I am. Um, at the bilateral level, uh, we've got several recommendations in the report. The one we think is most important is, is um, related to the SNED, and as one of the people who helped found the SNED told us, the SNED is neither strategic nor dialogue. Uh, and we think it ought to be strategic and, and a real dialogue, and therefore uh, we think uh, uh, the way to do that is to have President Obama and President Xi directly participate in the SNED. Uh, there's one coming up uh, next month. Uh, it probably won't follow this format, but we think both sides ought to start thinking about what they can do to turn uh, this a uh, great opportunity uh, where both governments focus intensely on, on each other and the relationship uh, to one where it's where they're not exchanging talking points where it's just it's not 60 people in that direction and 60 people in the other direction um, and then you go back to your regular life but how can you get real focus on, on critical issues at the regional level uh, we're uh, concerned uh, and think there's w w uh, potential stumbling blocks ahead. Uh, the United States uh, is heavily focused on uh, completing the TPP negotiations extremely soon. Uh, as you know, that 12, uh, the 12 countries that are participating in the negotiations, if now you include Japan, does not include China. Uh, it doesn't include a lot of APEC members. Uh, and, we th and the Chinese and ASEAN are also involved in negotiations for RCEP. Uh, and there's a real danger that we will see a significant divide in how in the Asia-Pacific economy, both in terms of the way trade and investment flows go, but in, in the norms of how business is done. And the companies that we talk to and others don't like that type of unpredictability and, don't, and that type of spaghetti bowl situation uh, is quite uh, worrisome. Um, there's now 354 uh, FTAs in force globally that, account, that handle most of the trade. And these two, we think potentially could be, uh, uh, you know, hurt, hurt economic growth. Uh, so we have some suggestions about if you're going to go forward, what you ought to do. Uh, but we're, we say proceed, but proceed with caution. Uh, lastly, 
uh, we, we, are, we s think that at the multilateral level, yes, we can talk about Doha around and the other things, but we think actually the most uh, uh, important suggestion that we have that's different uh, is that th there ought to be a s systematic timetable and roadmap set up for China to become a member of the OECD. The OECD is thought of as a rich countries club. Um, we think it ought to be thought of as an important countries club uh, that sets the standards, uh, provides research, information, uh, ca capacity building for the important me most important members of the international community. So we think uh, it's going to be important for China to adapt and be ready to prepare to join the OECD. Uh, we think it's going to be important, take time for the OECD, OECD and its current members to think what it's going to mean to have countries like China be uh, uh, there at the table negotiating, helping set those standards. All right, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, some of our trade recommendations. Um, at the bilateral level, um, th again, there's a lot of dialogues. I'm going to focus on some of the tensions and how they're currently handled. Uh, first, um, as you know, China is, a, is the world's l most common target of anti-dumping investigations. Uh, it turns out that uh, the U.S. has launched about 100 of those 884 cases since 1995. The leading uh, initiator of cases against China now actually is India, uh, but the U.S. has been a long-time traditional user of anti-dumping, and it's not really slowed down. Uh, if you add in the 34th province, uh, listed there independently at number four, uh, then you're well over 1,100 cases against country, uh, China, the Chinese. Uh, but the Chinese have learned. They've, they've learned from the lawyers who represent American industry in these cases. Uh, here's an example of one uh, longtime law firm deeply involved in helping American industry. And uh, the Chinese have developed their own law firms. Uh, this, is, this is one of them. This is probably the most important uh, uh, law firm that, that takes cases on behalf of Chinese industry. Uh, and they've been quite successful. They are international trade ambulance chasers. Um, and, and as a result, China has launched almost 200 cases against other countries, accusing them of dumping products in the Chinese market. Uh, I tend not to be a big fan of, of the anti-dumping regime. Uh, at many levels, it's become much easier to uh, accuse and prove country, co companies of dumping in your market and an easy way to get protection from competition which we think uh, uh, is, is bad for the economy overall because it, it hurts not only the, com the sectors that import those products, it hurts the consumers as well. Uh, but the Chinese have learned those practices from the United States and other members. Uh, and we, th we think that the anti-dumping regime uh, needs to be uh, substantially reformed, uh, both at the bilateral level and multilateral. Uh, at the multilateral level, um, on, on, in terms of trade, we're overall, we're, we're not, uh, we, of course we would like the, the, the dough around to be fixed, but on the term of dispute settlement, we're relatively sanguine about how, how things have gone. Uh, people thought that China's entry into the WTO would, would, would lead to a, a huge infill of the WTO's trade disputes basket inbox, and, and that's not occurred. Uh, there are f many more cases involving the United States, both as complainant and as respondent, than there are involving China. And China's record is very pedestrian, very normal. Uh, in general, uh, applicants, uh, complainants who bring cases to Geneva win uh, because it's expensive. It costs about a million bucks to bring a case in Geneva, at least. If it's a complex case like the Boeing Airbus case, open up your wallet a lot wider. Uh, but um, uh, about uh, the Chinese, uh, as respondents, have lost most of those cases, but so does everybody else. But when they're on the other side as the uh, applicant or complainant, they win uh, most of the time. Uh, they have very good lawyers. Those lawyers' offices are, are uh, just a few blocks from here up on Connecticut Avenue. Most of their lawyers are American lawyers. They have a few Chinese that help them out, uh, but they've hired the right lawyers and pay the right fees. And they don't complain about it anymore either. Uh, so China's, in terms of dispute resolution at the WTO, really not upset the systems uh, much at all. We expect those cases to rise, uh, and we th but we think the WTO has the capacity to manage them. Uh, the other one last problem in trade that that we're particularly concerned about. Um, I'm going to leave TPP to, to the Q and A and other things because I've already given you basically my thought. Is just about market economy status. Uh, when China joined uh, the WTO uh, in 2001, it it per, it uh, agreed to allow it to be deemed uh, or treated as a non-market economy for the first 15 years of its membership. 
Um, the United States uh, Commerce Department has a five-point test of whether a country is a market economy. Uh, and for a long time, the Chi uh, U.S. Uh, in anti-dumping cases has uh, treated China as a non-market economy. In anti-dumping cases, they would not take the U.S. domestic prices as the normal value to compare against the export price. They would construct a price, uh, or they would go to a third country and find the price of a price there of the comparable product. Um, treating China as a non-market economy is a boon for those for those trade lawyers uh, and for the companies seeking protection. Um, now, China ag agreed to. Uh, be treated this way for the first 15 years of membership, but in December 12, 2016, this ought to disappear. Well, based on our conversations uh, from those on the American side, they're not going to do that. Come December 12th, if they file a case, they're going to still treat China as a non-market economy, and they're just going to roll the dice, and they're going to wait for the Chinese to file a WTO case, which ought to come on December 13th, 2016. And It'll then take two, three, four years for that case to be resolved, and in those four years, the tariff margins that the Chinese will face will be quite high. Now, if you're looking short term, that's not a bad deal for the Americans seeking that protection. That's often what many WTO members do when they initiate a case. They're not even sure that they're going to win, but they're going to or they're going to drag it out as long as they can. Um, we think that's good short term. It's real bad long term for the WTO and for. Uh, the two countries getting along bilaterally and globally. So we, we think it would be good for the United States and other members of the WTO to today say that come December 12, 2016, they won't use this methodology anymore. We don't, we're not sure that's going to happen. It probably won't. But we think if they don't, uh, problems will ensue. Okay. All right. I'm going to turn things over to Hufan, who's going to talk about investment and finance. Hufan. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Um, first, I would like to uh, talk a little bit on um, the issue of investment, and uh, this is uh, for the uh, bilateral investment between China and the United States. And this is one area which is really uh, puzzling for me, because if we check the data, China's investment in the United States and the U.S. investment in China, and uh, you realize that neither is the other's most important uh, investor. Uh, U.S. used to, pay, to play a very uh, dominant role in China's uh, FDI, but that's a long time ago. That happened in the 1980s. And uh, since then, the share of uh, U.S. investment in China's FDI is declining dramatically. And at the same time, uh, uh, especially after the global financial crisis, China started to invest in the United States. And uh, uh, this... Uh, uh, growth rate of Chinese investment in the United States is, is very rapidly. But uh, uh, for the time being, the sheer size of China, China's investment in the United States is still very small. Um, by the end, uh, to the end of uh, 2011, and the total uh, stock of China's investment in the United States is less than 9 billion compared with uh, China's holding of more than one trillion U.S. dollar T bills, so there's nothing. China's uh, direct investment in China, there's nothing. But then the investment become one of the uh, mostly uh, heated, uh, uh, heatedly debated topic in the bilateral relationship. Um, China uh, uh, always uh, complain the. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, U.S. Uh, the uh, political resistance of Chinese investment in the United States. So these are some names uh, w w uh, among which you can uh, not only find those uh, state-owned enterprises, but also the large private companies like uh, Huawei. So this um, actually um, uh, make many Chinese people feel that uh, whenever a Chinese company uh, try to invest in the United States, and then the instinct of the uh, American, uh, some American politician is to shoot it down. Um, but U.S. doesn't uh, see it this way, and they still uh, picture themselves as one of the most uh, uh, free uh, market for foreign investment. And on the other hand, uh, uh, U.S. company is complaining about the situation in China, and some American uh, company is complaining the last uh, 10 years is the last decades. 
There's no reform. There's no further opening up. But then the feeling of U.S. company on the Chinese market is a uh, kind of uh, love and hate uh, because there's more fierce competition in the Chinese market. But at the same time, they are making money. So according to the new um, uh, in, uh, uh, report uh, released by the U.S.-China Business Council, 90% uh, of uh, American company investing in China uh, 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 is making money and is making more money than previously. But um, during our interview, one uh, American uh, CEO uh, told me that uh, uh, China is uh, very m much like uh, uh, an Apple product, uh, the iPhone or iPad. It's very cool, but it's using a totally different uh, operation system. Um, so they think that the Chinese market is very important, but then uh, they try to urge that China to further open its market, especially the service market. Uh, so we think that maybe in this area, um, which has the largest potential uh, to create mutual benefit. So actually we are thinking of a kind of grand exchange between China and the United States on investment issues. The idea is that uh, U.S. can further opening up and uh, welcome the Chinese investment which will make uh, Chinese people happy, uh, which will make a uh, Chinese company happy. But then uh, it will be uh, to the benefit of American people because with more Chinese uh, investment and then there will be more job created and, and, and then we will help the uh, recovery of the American economy. Even in some the uh, innovations like in the shell gas revolution, uh, you can see that the Chinese investment. So I think more uh, investment, uh, the Chinese investment, uh, Chinese investment in the United States uh, will be play a more and a more positive role. Um, at the same time, um, I think China should further liberalize its service sector, including uh, fi finance, insurance, and education and healthcare. Well, this will please American company, service company, but then it's to the benefit of Chinese people. So if you ask the Chinese people what they are unhappy, they're not hap unhappy because of the manufactured products that they, they can produce and that they can purchase. They are complaining about the lousy quality of the service, uh, public schooling and uh, a hospital and uh, whatever, the finance, uh, the finance uh, system. So if we can further, further opening up China's uh, service sector, and then it will create a huge pie for uh, foreign capital, uh, domestic private capital, and also including American companies. Um, but this is on the bilateral uh, level. And I think another area that China and the United States can cooperate with each other is at the uh, multilateral level. Uh, because previously, well, in the area of investment, actually there is no existence of a clear set of international rules regarding the uh, investment. Uh, in the area of trade, and you have WTO, and in the area of international monetary or finance, you have IMF. Um, well, it's not uh, very efficient, but still you have this international uh, institution. But in the area of investment, there's nothing. So maybe we, start, we need to start it from the scratch and build uh, 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 architecture uh, uh, on the uh, 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 governance of the uh, international investment. And the best way to do this, I think China and the United States has to cooperate with, with each other. Because traditionally, uh, the uh, practice and the rules regarding investment is mainly biased uh, toward the developed country. But now, including China and other emerging countries like India, Brazil, um, um, Russia, to name just a few, and they are not only the traditional recipient of foreign investment, they are also becoming a new um, investor uh, overseas. So uh, by including China and other emerging countries, and then uh, 
we can make this uh, new uh, international rules on investment to have more legitimacy and to encompass the interest of those uh, emerging uh, investors uh, in the uh, global stage. And there's also uh, the issue of uh, international finance. At the bilateral uh, level, uh, previously, the focus uh, was on the RMB uh, exchange rate. So uh, some um, American politicians always want to name and blame China as the uh, currency manipulator. Um, but then uh, if you look at the market, the market will have a different uh, uh, perspective because now with RMB exchange rate has already appreciated by more than 30%. And then if you also take into consideration that during the, the this uh, period of time, the, the inflation rate in China is higher than that in the United States. So in real term, RMB has appreciated more than 30%. Um, and it's moving closer to its equilibrium level. So I th think we should move from this uh, politicized uh, issue on uh, currency to more constructive uh, uh, issues. And one specific suggestion that we make is we can concentrate on the adjustment of current account. Before the global financial crisis, and uh, we all uh, think that this is a very important issue. The global imbalance, uh, by definition, is not uh, sustainable in the long run. And after the global financial crisis, well, both China and the United States has done some work uh, to adjust uh, its current account imbalance. Uh, the current account surplus to GDP, the ratio of current account surplus to GDP, has dropped from 10% in 2007 to uh, a little bit then higher than 2% in 2012. And this is uh, not only because the uh, macroeconomic policy adopted by Chinese government, but also because of some changes of fundamentals of the Chinese economy, like the rising of labor cost and then the uh, huge change of demographic profile. And this trend will continue. Um, so we have tr we have tried our best, but then uh, there uh, the the we, we we still there's more jobs that we we can do, because China is now uh, have the very ambitious plan to do uh, the structural reform, and this structural reform will provide a new momentum uh, uh, to balance its uh, uh, domestic economy. And at the same time, the uh, United States should also uh, uh, contribute more on this adjustment of global uh, imbalance. So um, previously at the G20 platform, uh, there was a proposal to set a certain benchmark, say 4% for the uh, current account imb imbalance. But then uh, it was rejected by the, the, the member countries. But whether we uh, continue to use 4% uh, or whatever, I think we should uh, concentrate more on this more broad goal on the adjustment of current account uh, imbalance. And then exchange rate is only one component of your policy tools. And you can use other policies uh, which may be more efficient. But then uh, you we have to target at this um, the final goal of uh, adjusting the current account uh, imbalance. And second issue is the management of uh, cap capital uh, flow, especially uh, short-term international capital flow. Uh, after the global financial crisis and the issue of uh, reform on um, uh, the financial regulation has become a very hot topic but for many developing countries, they think that this issue is very boring. It's re irrelevant because only United States and the UK and some European country has very sophisticated financial market. Wo so what's the, what, what's the implication for emerging countries? They are not interested in this topic. But they are concerned 
other issues. And one issue is the uh, hegemon power of the U.S. dollar. So U.S. dollar is now the de facto international currency on the international monetary system. But then there's, uh, there's no constraint. So countries, including China, emerging countries, including China, is worried about what would be the spillover effect of the American monetary policy. And so far, the Fed has the QE policy, but then uh, with the recovery of the American economy, and if they decided to exit from this QE policy, and if one day the interest rate in China, uh, 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 the interest rate in the United States started to increase, and what will happen uh, to those emerging market? Probably they will be create a large capital flight in the emerging market, which may trigger a financial crisis. It, China, after the global financial crisis, has witnessed a large capital flow. Sometimes it's hot money. Uh, inflow and sometimes is hot money outflow. So there, until now, there is no very clear rule and there is no very efficient uh, um, institution governing this uh, short-term capital flow. So if we can work on this issue, and then uh, we can also um, bring together other countries, including uh, the other emerging market and uh, advanced country and to tackle this issue, to uh, prevent next generation financial crisis, and then uh, to uh, make the, we can finally, we can achieve the goal set by the G20, uh, sustainable and also robust and uh, uh, balanced economic growth for the whole global economy. I think I will stop here. Thank you very much for those very informative presentations. Professor Kyler, would you comment? Sure. <laughs> it's, a real, uh, it's a real privilege to be a commentator for this on this report from two leading scholars, one from the United States, one from China, who've worked on these issues of global governance for some time, and as Scott pointed out, have mobilized a very impressive team of collaborators uh, in um, completing their project. It is also quite extraordinary because it's a report that actually has precise, concrete, and balanced recommendations, which I really commend to you, unlike many other products of bilateral collaboration. I have participated in many, not many, not as many of these as these gentlemen, but enough dialogue types of uh, enterprises to know that many of them come out after very interesting conversations with reports that are rather bland, to say the least. But this report has real uh, substance to it and, 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 as I say, very concrete and precise types of recommendations. Um, if I were going to summarize it, uh, it and you, you've heard a summary here, but from a slightly different perspective, they're not optimistic about global governance. They use the term gridlock and deficit to describe the current state, particularly of economic governance, and the report is, is um, basically directed toward global economic governance. I would just caution that, in fact, I'm a little more optimistic about the way the current system works than they are, probably. And not that it doesn't need fixing, but if we look back at the, the, the last major economic crisis, I think many people would have predicted that the global economic governance institutions would fragment, disintegrate, be ineffective, but generally speaking, they worked pretty much the way they were intended to. Uh, the WTO in particular, it seems to me, has served as a very useful safety valve, as they acknowledge in the report, in terms of dispute settlement between China, the United States, and other countries. Um, and even the IMF, it seems to me, served as a cheerleader for national policies that essentially moved in the right direction. And the contrast with other crises, particularly the Great Depression, it seems to me, uh, is pretty striking. And these, these institutions do need work, but in fact their performance uh, at a time of crisis was not so bad. Um, and, and in fact the U.S. government and the Chinese governments uh, should have some of the credit for that performance. They are optimistic, it seems to me, about the U.S.-China relationship, by and large, and about their ability to serve as leaders in global governance. Both countries have benefited from existing glo the global economic order. Um, neither of them has any incentives to upset the rules of the game as they exist now, it seems to me. They argue they're basically both conservatives um, in terms of the existing global economic order, at least. 
And they also point out and that these countries, uh, two countries engage in an extensive range of dialogues and discussions on global issues and their bilateral relations, much more extensive, I think, than most Americans certainly realize. And former Assistant Secretary Kurt Campbell has made this point in some of his recent, recent statements. Uh, there's a web of dialogues and exchanges and discussions between these countries across a wide range of issues now, uh, despite the sometimes somewhat slightly frigid at, uh, atmosphere when uh, certain high politics issues come onto the agenda. Um, and they um, um, generally make a general overarching uh, recommendation that this bilateral relationship, which is by and large successful or moving in the right direction, should be multilateralized, both to the benefit of the future global order and I think less noted in their report, but equally, impor uh, equally important, probably to the benefit of the bilateral relationship as well. And Arvind Subramanian at the Peterson Institute has made this case for trade, that basically it's probably not a good idea to put so much into the one basket of bilateralism, and that multilateralism in some sense defuses the bilateral relationship in certain respects, if it is successful. Um, I have to note that, that their optimism about the U.S.-China relationship and their view about where it should go is very, very different from an alternative vision, a kind of power transition view, which paints China as a challenger inevitably in the United States as the status quo power. And I particularly liked a point in their report in which they tried to avoid, as I have in my recent work, the notion of a status quo power, uh, because most countries would like to change some of the rules of the game some of the time. But it's rare that one country particularly wants to change all the rules of the game all the time. And the United States, if you look at the last decade, has probably been as much a changer or an aspiring changer of the rules of the game as China in many, many realms of activity. So I think that was a, a particularly nice part of their report. Let me talk briefly about their recommendations, which I think are very sensible. Um, in trade, the notion that uh, they're basically sanguine about the WTO, but they, they see the need, to, obviously, to try to restart the multi multilateral trade negotiations. I think their major risk they see is the risk from alternatives, particularly preferential trade agreements of various kinds, which have proliferated, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, over the last decade. Um, the recommendations on uh, foreign direct investment seem to be mainly bilateral, in fact. I mean, a kind of a grand bargain, as, um, as Hufan described, between the US and China. And uh, at the end of their recommendations, suggesting that perhaps there's a way of multilateralizing uh, rules, global rules on investment. And they correctly point out there really isn't a global regime on foreign investment. Unfortunately, that has been tried before. Uh, it was tried in the OECD. It's been tried in different forms, and it's failed. It failed at the OECD, partly because of NGO opposition, partly because some of the governments defected from the bargain. But the experience on global investment rules has not been great. And, uh, and in fact, most countries, it seems to me, rely on bits, bilateral investment treaties. And I honestly don't see uh, a strategy for getting the global side of this uh, restarted. But uh, I wish I could share their optimism on that, on that point. In monetary and financial, international monetary and financial policy, it seems to me, um, if we put the pieces together, if China really wants to internationalize the, the renminbi, which is the stated uh, goal of the government, then inevitably, as they point out in the report, and as Hufan has described, that implies capital account liberalization over time in China, and that implies lots of other things. Um, there, there's a complicated set of relationships between financial regulation, uh, capital account liberalization, RMB, internationalization, and when you see how that all will play out in the future, it seems to me that points toward less conflict probably over international monetary and financial policy, but ultimately that's a Chinese decision because it's an implication of the internationalization of the RMB and not, uh, not necessarily because of some a global sets of regulations or rules. I was a little puzzled and a little struck because it's an issue I work on that financial regulation is so boring. Uh, for the developing countries because, in fact, um, a recent work by um, uh, Rosemary Foote and Andrew Walter suggests that the Chinese government actually has used global rules on financial regulation to move ahead the reform process in China. And I think other governments, probably not macroeconomists like Professor Hufan, but maybe those who are more involved in financial regulation actually see global rules and the development of those rules as a way of not just constraining the United States and the EU, who were at the center of the financial crisis, but also perhaps 
helping to move ahead their own financial institutions, and this would be linked once again to the capital account liberalization that, that China faces in the future. But as I say, the recommendations in here are very, very sensible. My main problem with them are that they seem to rely too much on calls to leadership on the part of China and the United States. And, and, and although it's difficult in a report of this kind, it would have helped to have a sense of where the opposition is. Why hasn't this happened already? Uh, why is it going to be problematic going forward? And let me just suggest a few of those obstacles. For example, when we are urged to clean up our own houses, um, there are a lot of interests that are at the other end of that broom when you clean up a house. And, and just to give you a sense, first of all, there, there are those who are opposed to constraints on national policy autonomy in general. They don't like multilateralism for ideological, nationalist, or other reasons. Um, Scott Kennedy and Hufan are part, one part of a spectrum of opinion on this issue. They are, they are liberals, in, small l liberals, uh, who believe in multilateral cooperation. There are individuals in both countries who don't believe in it. And the, you could call them sovereigntists, or people who believe in high sovereignty cost. More subtly, there are also people I would call bilateralists, who actually think it's easier just to deal with China and the United States and leave the rest of the world out of it too. And there are always voices who say, let's do a G2 and get things solved that way. Um, and that's, a, that's potentially a problem, it seems to me, as well, because it is more efficient, probably. There are costs and benefits to moving to the multilateral level. And then, of course, there's a wide range of specific interests in each of the issue areas that, that uh, Scott Kennedy and Hufan have outlined here who have something to lose. There are winners and losers to having rules that encourage international economic exchange, which is what we're really talking about here. In many ways, this is a story about, on the US side, large international corporations, and on the Chinese side, large state-owned enterprises. And when they can get together and bargain successfully, probably something's going to happen. But there are other actors who are outside that game in both countries and have less of a political voice. In the United States, labor, which often sees this relationship as uh, um, detrimental to its interest. In China, one could say the rural sector, possibly, if we, we restarted the Do Doha round and agriculture were on the table. And I would have to say that both countries have not been particularly uh, astute or adept at compensating the losers from international economic exchange to the degree that they can be identified. Second set of obstacles concerns asymmetries in the relationship. Um, and, and in many cases, and the report is very clear on this, and I completely agree, as the relationship becomes more symmetric, for example, as China invests more abroad, many of the problems are going to disappear. Uh, two days ago, uh, uh, President Xi Jinping gave a speech to American multinationals in China. And it was a very conciliatory, positive speech about the value of foreign direct investment. And, and in the press account, one of the press accounts I saw, the justification given was that China is now much more concerned about the reaction of American multinationals because now they are investing abroad, right? So there's a reciprocity that there wasn't before, and that will have a, a, an effect on the willingness to uh, accept additional rules of the game, perhaps. But there is an asymmetry that's a problem that is pointed to in the report, and that is that global governance is not just about formal intergovernmental organizations. And China is disadvantaged when global governance moves to other types of forums that involve NGOs, private corporations, all the what we call in, in the trade hybrid organizations, which have become increasingly important in a wide range of areas, from corporate social responsibility to the environment uh, to development. Um, and China is in some sense a bit outside that game altogether simply because it doesn't have the same range of actors in global governance at the moment. Now, uh, Hufan can, can tell me whether that's likely to change or is changing, but I think that's a very important asymmetry that's yeah. likely to persist going forward. Final set of obstacles is multilateral. If this is multilateral, then what about everybody else? And how are they going to respond to this leadership? Not everybody wants to be led by the United States or China. Uh, and I can name some big countries in particular that don't, India being the first on my list. Um, <laughs> And of course, there's the possibility that in this generally benign economic picture, there will be spillovers from other types of issues, uh, high politics, foreign policy, military issues that are not part of this report, and there's no need they should be. So finally, where are the, where are the points of conflict likely to be? I think the report actually, if I could summarize it, it seems to me points to several areas. One is clearly what we could call system friction. And if you go through their issue areas, 
in investment, on the question of non-market economy and trade, on the TPP, all of this is about two fundamentally different political economies and how do they interact and exchange with one another to each other's benefit. And how much do they each have to change in terms of some very basic institutions for there to be a, 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 a minimal level of conflict? And, and what can multilateralism contribute to that? There's also a problem, though, on the leadership front from the fact that both of these countries, I think, are going to be very distracted domestically going forward. They both have very big domestic agendas. And in fact, the authors, when they say they should clean up their own houses, in many ways are undermining their own case to a degree. Because if you're involved in cleaning up your own house, you're not going to be too involved with what's going on outside your house. And I think both countries face big, big agenda items, the environment in China, income distribution. In the United States, the debt problem and how that's going to be resolved, which has distributional implications. So there's a real question here of um, how do you get these two governments to exercise their leadership when they have this domestic tug. Finally, multilateralism is great, but it is less efficient, as I've already said, than other forms because there are more actors involved. And it won't just be China and the United States. It will necessarily be India, Brazil, and a whole host of other large players. And as you add more players, by necessity, less efficiency. And if you restrict it, it's less legitimate. So that's just a trade-off I think you have to face. And clearly, it's more likely to be faced in a productive way if China and the United States collaborate in the way that Scott Kennedy and Ho Fan have described. So thank you very much. It was a great report. Thank you for those very insightful comments. I want to open the floor to the um, audience, but I wonder if we could take a minute or two to see if uh, Dr. Kennedy or Dr. Hua would like to make a very brief response to um, uh, Professor Kyler's comments. Uh, want me to start? You want to? I'll, I'll go yeah. say a couple things. Yeah. All right. First. Um, uh, thank you very much. Extremely helpful, uh, friendly remarks uh, that um, I think helps summarize what we wanted to say better than we could say it ourselves. <laughs> um, and, and so I really appreciate that. I, I think um, in some ways um, we're, we're not as optimistic as, as perhaps uh, you thought we were. I, 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 but I, I think our, our goal here was to say if they're going to do something, here's what our wish list would be, and even if they're not all politically feasible. So uh, we thought we'd write them down anyway. <laughs> Uh, and, and so we, we, we um, if, 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 if academics who are thinking about these things don't mention them, then, then no one is going to. And so, and so I think we, we might as well. Um, I, and we did try to point to what we see are differences in, in their approaches to global governance that we think do ra raise problems uh, for, for them. Um, in terms of the leadership I would th about that the U.S. and China we think ought to provide, we're we're not, ne at least for myself, I'm, I don't think that our, our purpose is to say, well, we definitely want everyone to, to get in line behind these two and follow along in the, in the direction that they want to lead. Um, I would agree if that's what we were suggesting, that would be that no one would, that very few would do that. And if you don't have India and Brazil and the others uh, in board, then that's not. But I think the leadership is almost partly leadership by example and also the willingness to be in the rules of the game. So, so to some extent, it does require that willingness uh, on the, you know, the talk about those who are more willing to, um, to you know, give up the, that sovereigntist position. So I would agree on, on that side. Um, but at the same time, in terms of that leadership, but, but since we are concerned, as you are, uh, and, and realize that multilateralism is inefficient and uh, requires attention away from the domestic, is why we also have tried to highlight that this, addressing these issues uh, requires attention at multiple levels, both at, the, at multilateral level, regional, bilateral, uh, as well, I didn't talk about plurilateral, which I could have as well in terms of clubs. Uh, so um, I guess the thing is, you know, if th something doesn't work at that level, you switch to another level, or you try them at multiple levels at the same time. And as the gentleman from the Peterson Institute you mentioned said, uh, they may be mutually reinforcing as in instead of just uh, distracting. Dr. Hu? Um, two very quick uh, response. One uh, is why I think financial regulation is a boring. <laughs> topic. Um, I, I think uh, the financial guy may think it's very interesting. 
uh, one of my friends in the uh, banking supervision committee in, 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 in China, he uh, fly to Basel every two weeks, and he know much better uh, about Basel three than I do. But I still, I believe that this is not the, uh, uh, this will not solve the problem um, for China's financial system because for the time being, the non-performing loans in China's banking system is very low and we are well prepared. Uh, we can uh, ask a Chinese uh, commercial bank to adopt the Basel III at any time. Yeah. Tomorrow we can, we can do that. Yeah. But uh, will that solve the problem? And the more serious problem for China's financial system is one, how can we uh, channel this uh, uh, domestic saving to, for example, like a small and medium-sized companies? And we cannot find uh, the appropriate business model. And second, uh, 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 the current business model is the banking play a dominant role in China's financial system, and their main clients are the companies in the manufacturing sector. And then if your clients is the manufacturing uh, company and you ask for collateral, and they do have, they have land and they have equipment and they have everything. And then their cash flow is very stable. And because in the last uh, one decade, the productivity in the manufacturing sector increased dramatically. So they do have the profit. So this, is very simple business model. Even Forrest Gunn can do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in the future, in the future, the service sector has to be developed. But if you have more clients from the service sector, you have the law firm come to the, your commercial bank and ask for a loan. So what kind of collateral you can, you can ask? So these are the real challenges, I think, and we, we have to tackle. Um, China's lesson from the last three decades is we uh, always, we, we use the opening up and then to provide uh, momentum for domestic reform. But in that case, on the financial area, I would like to say that we will directly open the financial sector in China rather than just uh, open the capital account, mm -hmm. uh, which will encourage the speculative short-term capital flow. But then if you open your service sector and uh, you, in, 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 uh, you encourage the American company and European company and come to China and you can create competition and then you can improve the quality, the service of China's service sector. Um, second response uh, is on the uh, NGOs. I think there is a silent, um, it's not revolution, but silent change happened in China, especially uh, um, after the Lianghui, the uh, People's National People's Congress. And now for some NGOs like uh, Industrial Associate and some other um, um, NGOs, uh, previously uh, Chinese government has a very strict regulation on NGO. But now if uh, you want to have Industrial Association or whatever, and then uh, is more easily and you just go there and then uh, fill in the form and then uh, they will prove that so I'm trying uh, I'm thinking of trying to uh, uh, establish a chess club when I go back to <laughs> Beijing and to see uh, if uh, yeah the uh, the uh, Min Zheng the Min Zheng uh, of government official really <laughs> understand uh, the top political leaders uh, thinking yeah. <laughs> But that will be a uh, long way to go. But e b because even we have this uh, uh, opening up for NGO, but then uh, there will be a learning by doing process. So I think that gradually they will play a more active role. Uh, thank you for those comments. Uh, I'm surprised that uh, nobody mentioned the problem of how do you exercise leadership in global economic governance when you occasionally encounter leaders who have a very poor grasp of economics, let alone of global economics. So, uh, but that's a, a side issue. No, uh, that's, that's not China's problem. We <laughs> have the premier w which has PhD in economics. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, I seem to recall in the United States that we had a candidate in 2008 <laughs> who said he didn't know anything about economics. <laughs> so, <laughs> but he's not the current president. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, please identify yourself sure. uh, also. Uh, my name is Arnold Zeitlin, and I teach uh, in China, in Guangzhou. Uh, two, two things, two items. Uh, one, could you expand uh, on your suggestion of uh, Xi and Obama participating in the dialogue? I ask partly in reference to uh, Dr. Kaler's remarks about the distractions of domestic affairs. Plus, I know in the case of Mr. Obama, tremendous international distractions. Uh, why do you suggest this? What do you hope their participation on a regular basis uh, would uh, achieve, uh, other than perhaps being a recipe for frustration? And the second point I ask uh, is, is there any value in greater openness in China to this whole debate? Both excellent questions. Uh, thank you. I, th I think um, uh, leaders tend to, to be uh, firemen and, and focus on putting out fires. Um, uh, and if there's any other time in the day, then maybe they'll, they'll do some other things. Uh, and certainly we have a variety of fires uh, or potential fires burning uh, uh, in, around the globe, including uh, very close to China. Um, but um, they get uh, control of their schedules to some extent. Uh, President Obama does go to APEC, even though APEC is just a talk shop. Um, but there's an other part, and, and so they, they realize that on some occasions there's, there's value to thinking long term if they can. Um, and um, I, I think the willingness of the, the, the leaderships to, to be more exploratory um, will create an atmosphere for their bureaucracies to be more exploratory. And it, uh, it may not result immediately in, in specific policy changes. Um, but um, these are th we're, we're thinking in decade terms, uh, and, and we need to think in decade terms. I know that th that doesn't fit with the, with the pol political cycle um, and, and is, is inconsistent with it. Um, but we're, 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 that's our job is to give suggestions about what we think ought to be done, even if there's uh, serious challenges to them. Um, I th uh, uh, as we've, we've tried to suggest that, that greater uh, liberalization of China w will be beneficial as Chinese industry associations and other NGOs can play a more activist role. Uh, they will be more involved in those hybrid organizations that Professor Kaler mentioned. Um, and uh, as someone who originally did research on business lobbying in China, uh, and so I have very, a lot of familiarity with Chinese industry associations. There are some that are very good. There's a wide variation, particularly at the local level. Uh, and so if they, as they do mature, it's not going to be just because of what happened on, with a policy document the state council issued on, on March 26th this year. Um, so it, 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 it's, a, it's a long path. But I think that will mean that the U.S. and Chinese will be able to be, will be participating at, at relatively similar levels in similar types of organizations. Um, and that asymmetry, I think, will, will decrease. Similarly, uh, the uh, greater liberalization of the media in China will allow for much better flows of information and discussions and transparency. Um, when, when governments have more activists, uh, domestic industry and stakeholders and NGOs and better media, they have better information to both uh, decide what policies ought to be and, and um, to be able to stand behind them. So we think those things will be better for global governance. Um, can I just add one word? Um, we uh, got the inspiration from history, and uh, I'm sure Ambassador Roy uh, knows better than I do, um, because now he's in the Kissinger Institute for China and the uh, United States. So last month, uh, Dr. Kissinger went to China to attend the uh, China Development Forum in Diao Yu Tai, uh, 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 the uh, so he was sitting there and say, this is the place uh, where I had the uh, uh, talk with Chairman Mao and uh, Premier Zhou Enlai. So at that time, when 
President Nixon and uh, Dr. Kissinger went to China, and they will have a long talk with the political leaders in China. And this one long talk will set the basic tone for the bilateral re relationship for the coming one decade or even two decades. So this is what we think is missing for the current uh, bilateral dialogue. There are too many issues, too many technical issues, like food security and uh, uh, the uh, infectious disease or whatever. But then what is missing is this uh, uh, grand strategy. And we have to step back and then uh, to have this uh, take into the consideration the history and the politics, culture, and also economics, and, and then to have this uh, uh, long-term forward-looking view and concentrate on the most important issue, uh, not only for China and the United States, but also for the, the whole global economy. Yes, in the back there. A reporter from The Voice of America. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor Kennedy. I, if I didn't get you wrong, you were saying that China's identifying of itself as a developing country is actually prevent China to be a more effective stakeholder. So could you elaborate on that? And could you give us some uh, concrete examples? Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, this is uh, a very good question. The um, if uh, uh, part of the idea of claiming uh, of defending oneself as a developing country is to put yourself in uh, with a group of other countries uh, and not in a group with others. So by saying you're developing and focusing on that, then you're saying, well, there are developing countries and then developed countries, and we're not one of those. Uh, and so on key issues, so th and that those type of identity concerns may affect where one comes down on certain policy positions simply because of the identification first. Um, also, uh, the WTO has a variety of rules and, and guidelines and things which uh, affect how countries are treated uh, in terms of tariffs and other things and scheduling and so, uh, of, of, of tariffs reductions and things based on their economic level as well. Um, but I, th I think the r another reason is, is that if you say you're a developing country, then uh, more broadly, you, you think you, you, you deserve some type of special treatment. I think the idea of being developed is we need special treatment. Um, China, we are a, a, uh, a large country, but we have a lot of people, and so at a per capita level, we're relatively poor. Uh, go outside Beijing, and you'll find all these problems. So how could, because of that, how could we possibly more quickly reduce our carbon emissions? How could we? How could the people possibly afford to pay higher prices for this or that? Um, and so I think that creates uh, reduced expectations. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, as uh, you know, it's important. American negotiators uh, or that we've talked to like to tell the Chinese, China is not Chad. China is a big, successful country in many areas, and Chinese like that. And and President Xi now trumpets China's success uh, and asking Chinese to think about the chi achieving the China dream. So uh, our suggestions for helping modify Chinese uh, thinking about how uh, China identifies itself and participates is actually a conversation which Chinese themselves are also participating in. And, we, and so I don't think that we're making suggestions which are uh, inconsistent with where we see the broad trajectory of, of, of the direction. It, can I just add one word? I think China is a developing country, but there are another dimension that we can uh, think of uh, China's uh, uh, role play. Because, um, um, so one dimension is you can divide the country into developing country and the developed country. But another dimension is that uh, you have large country and a small country. So actually large country, whether it's a developing large country or a developed large country, they may share some common interest with each other. Norway is an advanced country, but I think uh, United States may have more common interest uh, with China than with Norway. Um, so even 
Chinese people themselves is um, started to think uh, China as a large country. So in the Shibada Baogao, and they have the new coined the new term as the uh, uh, newly rising large power. So they think China itself as one of the this large power, not a hegemon, but a large country. So the challenge is now you have large country, not the typical advanced large country, but also you have, including the BRICS country, the large emerging and developing country. And for United States, and how to build a more friendly relationship with this emerging large country. That's a problem. That's a challenge. Secretary Bryson? Uh, just a minute, the uh, uh, microphone. Uh, thank you. So I'm John Bryson, and I was the U.S. Secretary of Commerce until somewhat recently. And the first question I would have, and if there's room, I'll address the second, and that is what I'm doing here at the Woodrow Wilson Institute. But the, I, of course, headed the JCC negotiations with Lunky Sean for a time. And then I always also traveled with Hillary Clinton, the U.S. Secretary of Treasury, um, the head of our, you know, JCC negotiations. We had the International Trade Administration, but we also had um, Professor Kirk, uh, who's an extraordinary person. All these people have now stepped down. And Wonky Sean has taken a new position in the Politburo. And we all found Wonky Sean to be an extraordinarily strong negotiator on behalf of Chinese interests, but someone who also understood and understood deeply the U.S. economy. So our capacity to work under some tensions but with mutual respect and an ability to work effectively together was a standout quality he th that he brought. And now he's taken this position in the Politburo, a smaller Politburo, under President Xi, and has taken a new position by name. Can you just suggest what that might mean in terms of our economic work with China, we the U.S., number one, and number two, what is the significance of his taking in a smaller Politburo this responsibility for eliminating corruption or taking it out of the reality that it has been a significant element of Chinese negotiations and life with our country and other countries like India for a very long period of time. Um, well, I can just provide some of my uh, personal uh, understanding. I think the reason why uh, uh, yeah, uh, Wang Qishan had a new position because uh, um, uh, usually the domestic issue will be on the priority of China's political agenda, and uh, we have come to the uh, um, the the high time that to launch on such an anti-corruption uh, campaign uh, to win back the. Uh, support from the general public. And you can see that the uh, President Xi Jinping and uh, um, uh, when he w was in position and uh, a lot of new policies um, for the uh, construction of the party and then to um, in, in, in this uh, uh, anti-corruption uh, uh, and the internet. So all this, I think, uh, points to one direction, uh, which means that in the future, this social policy and uh, maybe to some extent political reform will become more important than in the past. Because in the past, the most important thing is economic growth. So you, ha you have high economic growth and people will be pleased. But now, yes, we have very high economic growth, but there's growing 
discontent from the general public. So maybe the new Chinese government and they will put this uh, social policy um, mm -hmm. at more important uh, role. Um, for the Sino-U.S. relationship, I think is always one of the most important uh, issue for the top political leader. And started from Chairman Mao and then uh, Deng Xiaoping and the, the uh, other um, Chinese top political leader. And uh, this is one thing that they uh, concentrate on. So even at the uh, uh, premier or deputy premier level, and there will be new, uh, uh, there will be new one in charge of this uh, SED. But um, in fact, in this Sino-U.S. relationship is beyond this SED. It's always the uh, one of the major concern of the top political leader. And for the for the new uh, uh, deputy premier, I think Wang Yang will be also very. Uh, he he knows quite a lot on economic issues, and he's open-minded, and uh, he also have this uh, uh, very uh, good uh, uh, credentials on domestic issue and uh, international issues. So I think he'll he'll do a very successful job. Yeah. I think we've run out of time. Uh, so. I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking our presenters. And, uh, <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Very good.